Welcome back, everyone. This is Josh Newton. It is April 1st, and this is episode number 34. <clears throat> so, I, uh, you have to excuse the, uh, the cracking of the lightsaber if you're watching. I, I apologize. I started, I started recording, um, I don't know, couple minutes ago and as soon as I hit that record button I started cackling and hacking and got something in my throat anyway trying to work through that here but I'm on a I'm on a time uh, a time crunch and I want to I want to chat with you guys so um, I was it was going back and forth on some of the things that were kind of rolling around in my brain today and I almost just sat down and started freewheeling and I thought it would probably be a better, a better show for you all um, if I uh, jotted down a couple quick notes. So um, I hit some kind of uh, bigger, bigger topics, um, and we could probably do a show on each one. But um, organizing your farm for success kind of jumped out at me. So I want to explore some of the <clears throat> the things I think are important. And maybe uh, maybe I'll t- tackle that particular topic from a few different ways, and and we'll we'll run through some of those things. I also want to touch on uh, a few things that we've done in the past, and I'd be curious to know um, your all's thoughts on on how we go about doing this, uh, because I want the show to be good for you, um, and and obviously I want to enjoy doing it. So we. Uh, Obviously, this this show is is free, and I don't intend on making it a a, a paid show, so I'm not coming at it from there. But in the past, we've had um, we've had sponsors of the show, and uh, we've done you know ad reads. We we've done segments like product of the week. Uh, we've done in the news, like things that happen in the in the service industry. And I'm curious, you know, uh, of those things that I just mentioned. Uh, which ones, you know, would you guys mind hearing? Would you like to hear? Would you like to hear more from? Things of that nature. Um, obviously, in our world today, you know, we're we're just bombarded with with ads everywhere. Um, but you know, advertisements and sponsors help monetize the show. That allows me to, you know, take away from the things that I do to put food on the table for our family and and do this show. It helps monetize the show a little bit. So um, curious what that looks like uh, from all of you. I'd love to get a private message. Uh, you can hit me on Facebook. Um, you know, just it's Josh Newton. I'm holding a big old set of sheds. You can't can't miss me. Um you know, if you're on Instagram, you can check out the Servant Solutions page, or my handle is Dear Wizard. Um, and then, uh, you know, I have my email as well. It's J Newton N E W T O N at ServidSolutions.com. Shoot me a quick message. I, I'm I'm really curious. Um, I've been thinking more about this um, about this podcast, and obviously the the for those watching on on YouTube and the YouTube channel. And, and starting to add some what I feel are, are beneficial things to, to cover and uh, topics and informations and taking the show in, in multiple directions. So anyway, uh, just, you know, if you have some thoughts, ping me on those. So let's get into the uh, let's get into the topic of the show. Again, it's April 1st. So whatever I say today may or may not be accurate. That's my pass for today. Um, as it is. April Fools for for those that don't know what April first is that's April Fools anyway so organizing your farm for success um, the first main topic that uh, came up for me like when I was just like okay what what does that mean what is what is the measure of success and and what are some of those those things how do we quantify that I think we've we've discussed this before but setting yourself up for Ongoing success, ongoing, long term. I think for many of us, I know, I know for many of us, uh, including myself, 
there are things that we would have done differently on our farm uh, had we known now what we knew then. And that's the, the age old added adage of uh, wisdom and, and experience. And mostly I think that's pasture management slash pen setup, um, handling systems, facilities, those types of things. So I think first we need to we need to define what that success is and every single person's going to have a different answer for this. So is this um, is this a hobby farm? I would say, you know, here again, we're in, we're in Pennsylvania. Um, the overwhelming majority I guess I don't know that uh, per se. Many of the people I know, um, this would be a secondary business. There are uh, many of us, myself included, that um, draw our primary incomes from the servant industry. And it's important for us to uh, look at that from in, in those lenses, right? So, you know, my my take may be very different from someone that uh, the deer are, uh, I'm going to use air quotes, fun for them. They're fun for me. Don't get me wrong. This is why I do this. I love it. I love these deer. Um, but it's a, uh, it's a way to um, have some recreation in their life, stress relief, um, you know, you know, perhaps it's there to try to generate a little bit of income or spend income. Um, I don't know what they, what, what's the proper term for that these days? Because uh, you can get in trouble for saying anything. Um, tax deferment? Sure. So anyway, um, I, 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 I want to come at that from, from this angle. So when I talk about organizing... The, the, again, the physical setup of the farm, I think, is really important. And having, having a farm that is functional is ultra important, right? So I, I think depending on the number, the key would be, I always think we, we would want to work backwards, right? So if you said... If one of your metrics was you want to have a, I'm just throwing numbers out, you want to have a, a net 40K number at the end of the year, you got to figure out how many animals you're going to need to make that happen um, to offset your expenses. So are you going to be doing this by yourself? Are you going to be paying an employee to take care of the animals? You know, most smaller, smaller operations are... They're going to do that stuff themselves. So there's not necessarily a direct payroll. I, you know, I know there's a bunch of deer farmers that, that don't pay themselves um, per se. And then there's also the, you know, the idea that, um, you know, some of these larger operations have many employees. There are many mouths to feed. So I think that's, that's one thing to, to look at and work backwards from there. But with that said, the, the physical setup of the farm is going to be dictated by really two things. The number of animals that you, three things, the number of animals that you need to run, the number of animals that you want to run, and it probably comes out first. I want to run, you know, 300 head. I need to run um, 350. And the, the, the third thing is uh, space and geography. So... In other words, you know, we just don't have enough space to adequately run 300, but we or 350, but we can run 300. So um, that's going to be that's going to be a really, really big component. Um, and maybe you could start small and scale up. You know, maybe you have the property to do that. Um, so working basically off of kind of the principles that we've laid out before. Um, four to five, four to six adult deer per acre with the smaller um, smaller animals be able, being able to, you know, kind of be compressed, if you will, into uh, 
uh, smaller spaces for a period of time. And as they grow into adult size animals, we kind of ramp them up into that, that space. So you would lay out your fawning pens in a certain way. You would have um, potentially rotational grazing or, or, or fallow pens so they could sit for a little bit. Uh, you would have buck only pens or grow out pens and they may be adjusted by size based on, on age class. So uh, I think all those are, are really important things. And then, you know, typically the way I, that I've seen most farms kind of, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about like stacking in my mind, you know, you have your handling facility or your barn, which is kind of the, the core, um, you know, hub of your, of your farm, right? And then everything kind of is, is built around that. Now, most things that I've seen, you'd have like a, a, a barn closest to your, your uh, road structures, and then everything would be, you know, basically stacked. And if you're watching on the video, um, you know, you're, you're seeing, you know, basically a grid. So pen after pen after pen after pen, pushing all the way back into your, you know, your, your acreage. And then as you get further back, the pasture size increases and your bucks would be the furthest away. Now, why do we do that? Well, the most quote unquote commotion is gonna be closest to the to your hub. That's the, the lifeblood of your farm. So you have feed trucks coming in, uh, deliver feed, you're doing maintenance on equipment, your you know, your your tools and your workshop are there, your handling facility is there, all that stuff's kind of based right there. And it's important to it's important to understand that we want our bucks to be, you know, a certain way. And that if we're having a, you know, a breeding facility that is accompanied by a calmer group of does necessarily, they would be able to handle the stress of, you know, that's a stress, I guess, having, you know, people and dogs and kids and delivery trucks and all that action happening you know, closer they would be more accustomed to it. Not that the bucks wouldn't be, but we don't want them to be. And then those bucks would be kind of in the the back, if you will. So um, that was, I think that's a, a good, you know, base to, to work from. And again, that's going to look different for everyone. So um, the next question I have here is, what type of operation do you run? And like, what does that look like? So I can give you, uh, excuse me. I can give you one example. And that's the farm that I manage here, Red Ridge Whitetails. So Red Ridge is a small farm. We run somewhere between 10 and 14 does. We have uh, 15, I currently have 15 bread does. Uh, one of those is a surrogate. And we have four 2020 Dauphins slash, you know, they're going to be a year old here anytime. So um, we have eight does slated for, for calling to get our numbers back down. We want to maintain under 10 uh, breeding does, you know, on average any given year. So we're a little high this year, and that's because my buck numbers are low and we had we had sold off. So until I build that kind of equilibrium back up where I have decent uh, numbers and age structure on my bucks, I gotta, I gotta keep a certain amount of does, but that doe number really, you know, it shouldn't exceed, t you know, ten. That's plenty. So when we look at the, the type of operation that we run, we have a few rules, um, and these are gonna seem, kind of odd to to some people, and I'll tell you why. Then we don't sell does, we don't sell doe funds. Um, they're an exposure or a risk that we're not willing to take. We sell bucks, we sell stalkers and hunt bucks, and we think that the the risk 
for the return that we get on those is, is acceptable. Uh, and we also sell semen. But those does, you know, let's just, let's be real, generally speaking, and we don't, just to be clear, we don't play in the, in the high-end uh, breeder market, if you will, anymore. You know, the, the days for us, you know, buying and selling, you know, ten and fifteen thousand dollar does is, is over. That's gone. Um, we we don't have interest in, in continuing down that road. What we do have interest in is really well. I, I think they're going to be specialized and unique uh, stalker genetics, and building you know a really exceptional line of uniform and consistent almost niche type deer now whether we can do that or not i mean i can i can throw all these fancy adjectives out there and be like oh we're gonna do this we're gonna do that um we're gonna try okay we're gonna try to do it and and i think through you know these podcasts and this kind of journey we go on um, i'm hoping that i can articulate how we're gonna do that and if you choose to, to join in that process in some capacity, um, kudos to you. If you think I'm a, a, a bumbling fool, <laughs> um, that's, that's fine as well. So um, why is it that we don't sell females? Well, we sold a female in February 2014. And... Uh, 40 months later in a um, the first depopulation in uh, 2017 here uh, in DMA2 in Pennsylvania she had tested positive for chronic wasting disease in the lymph node only so under the USDA program and the HCP program which is the herd certification program here in Pennsylvania my farm had to be had to be quarantined um, for up to sixty months. So they <clears throat> they contacted us um, August eighth, uh, twenty seventeen. Sorry, uh, it's been it's been a little bit. Um, twenty seventeen, and said so you can get off of quarantine um, February two thousand nineteen. Okay, well when you call somebody in August. And they have, you know, 30 bucks ready to go. It's going to be a big problem. So we ended up, um, (laughs) you know, not literally eating that inventory. And that's a whole nother topic of conversation. But we had to keep all those animals for two seasons. Uh, So we had 20, 20 months of quarantine that we had to do. And that was all over a dough that we sold for like 2000 bucks. Now, we've obviously, we've learned a ton from that experience. We've found ways to manage and mitigate our risk to the best of our ability while nothing's set in stone. And we've also learned, you know, through negotiations and conversations with the agriculture department, what they are and are not willing uh, to accept as part of these uh, quarantines and, and such. And I, I guess this is a little bit of a timely conversation considering the, um, you know, the situation that's going on in Texas currently. I guess there's um, there's two farms that have been identified to have uh, chronic wasting disease, two, two new farms. Uh, they've, they've had it in the state. And um, I think I read they had two, 220, 220 positives so far in the, in the state. Um, you know, that's, <clears throat> while tragic, um, I, I think if you look throughout the country, this is, this is not something that's, uh, something that's new, right? You have, uh, you know, like a state like Pennsylvania, you know, you have hundreds of cases. Um, you look at a state like Wisconsin that, you know, I think their first identification was in 2002, you know, they're in the thousands, um, and then as you, you know, same thing, I think Illinois, uh, you know, over a thousand. And then as you move out west and you get into, you know, Colorado, Wyoming, kind of the original epicenters, you know, we're talking, you know, th- thousands. I don't know what Colorado's up to. I s- 
probably over 10,000. I should actually look, but um, anyway, <clears throat> so there is there is risk within the industry relating to uh, chronic wasting disease. Now, since um, 2017, there's been a lot of changes in our ability to manage these effective farms through different testing protocols and um, various, you know, natural resources departments, uh, parks and wildlife, DNRs, game commissions, agriculture departments, things like that. Um, that you know, there's there's things that we can do. There's there's a variety of. Uh, of stuff that they've they've kind of opened their um, their minds to. So I think it's uh, I think it's Im- important to kind of uh, remind yourself of that today and 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 say okay, we're in a different environment. <clears throat> so that's why we don't sell does because a does um, lifespan, if I would say, generally speaking, in the in the breeding world, is longer than a buck's, and you have more risk exposure with the more does you sell, and those does can end up going here, there, everywhere, and maybe end up in an in endemic zone, and you know potentially get wrapped up in a in a trace out or a quarantine or something like that, which ultimately could affect you. So, again, we we just. We're, it's it's not worth it to us today to sell, you know, uh, you know, a thousand or two thousand dollar dough or whatever that may be, and potentially have the whole farm locked down because, you know, that was a that was a big time loss. I mean, I think we called uh, twenty six does, and at that time, the, this was kind of the the end of our our you know bought does you know we had we had purchased much of our inventory or a good chunk of our inventory um 2007 8 9 and then it kind of tapered down from there but that was we still had a, a ton of animals that were bought so there was there was ex, uh, uh, capital expense that was exposure um and you know we just you have to you have to work through that. So anyway, yeah, uh, twenty, yeah, twenty six does, and you know, there was certainly some death loss uh, from these these bucks because when you keep, I don't know what we had, twenty, twenty two, twenty three, um, three year olds and a couple four year olds. You know, we're not we're just not set up here to to house those kinds of animals uh, long term. We can get to grow out, but they're ready to go after that. And and when you have to sustain when you have to sustain those those animals long term, it's not looking good. So we, we you know I don't I don't recall the exact number, but I don't know. I bet you we lost six six bucks over those uh, two years. Maybe more, probably more. I, I would have to look. Um, but I do know the dough number is accurate because I, I had to kill them um, just because we physically don't have the space to, to keep them all. So that's that's kind of how the, the calling started. Um, anyway, so that brings us to where we are today. And that is a relatively lean system. And we've talked about, you know, function stacking if you you want to check out a, an interesting episode what what can you do to basically uh, sustain your farm and the dis- different uh, types of you know business practices and and sale products and services uh, check out that show I, I want I don't recall what it was number 20 maybe um, it's called the function stack and I kind of run through run through those uh, those different aspects of the, the servant industry business and I'm sure there's other ones that I missed um, but you know taking advantage of, of those kinds of things so um, what we do and and like I, I started before I got off on my my usual tangent um, you know we want to raise really really high quality bucks we don't want to raise um, a, a lot of them we don't we just don't have the space here and that's fine 
um, because I have a, another business that I that I run, and um, you know I just I don't have the the, the time to to manage that all. Uh, it's not to say that I wouldn't enjoy it. I, I certainly would, um, and and maybe one day I'll get a, a chance to do that. But you know that's not that's not today. So um, I want to maximize w- what I have here, and that just is a small number of bucks. So looking at that. I want to have a really um, specialized product to sell to people, and I, I wrote down a I wrote down a note here. Um, you know, it was it was how to be the best at something, and it's kind of like a, what is this a, a, a self a self help podcast or a, a, a book? No, no, it's not. Um, but you know, how do you be the best at something? Because I, I think. Um, that's a, an important thing to look at. And you can look at what the industry may consider, you know, people being the best. But I'll say, I'll say this, in my mind, um, the diversity is the enemy of greatness. And what I mean by that is I think that most of our breeding programs are all over the place and that when we're selecting specific crosses and when i say we i mean me i mean you i mean everyone um we're not we're 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 quote unquote making the best you know for that particular cross but there's not a ton of relation between the, the, the matings all the way across the board. So like a lot of places they'll have like, you know, they might have 30 deer and they might have or 30 breeding does and they may have 20 or t- 23, 24 different genetic lines. And like they got to make this cross and make that cross and this one has to be perfect and it's like how how are you gonna have a how are you gonna have a standard now when I start talking like this you know I'm not talking about I am talking about I'm talking about making cookie cutter deer and people are like what I want all of my deer to look the same. Now, people are like, well, aren't whitetails supposed to be unique and special? Yes. There are so many deer out there. I mean, there's 30 million whitetail deer in the United States. 30 million. On my farm, if I produce six or eight bucks a year and they all have the same look, they're not going to be identical. But if they have all the same type of look, do you, do you think people are going to be like, oh, I'm tired of looking at those deer? No. Now, pair that with that idea of being niche, that specialty deer, that u- unique animal. Now you got a powerhouse combination. Well, how do we do that? How do we how do we go from point A to to point Z? without making a mockery of things you don't diversify maybe you do it first maybe it takes you know many doe lines to figure out what you like and that certainly takes time what i would suggest if if you're interested in tackling a new project you already have a farm you're well established whatever or you're a new a new person you know go to somebody else's farm that has had deer for a long time and see if they'll spend time with you and go through their stuff um man i can sit down and i can talk for like a day on one doe line that we have here and just go through all the different animals we've had and and just the things that we've seen over the years and and you know why that's still here today etc um but <clears throat> when you, the, the, the point for me is, is that I want my diversity in my doe line to be very small. 
I really, I, I think that if you're, again, we're at 10 does, I want a minimum of 80% of my animals to be the same. Now, what is the same? I want them to have considerable familial f f familiarity. That's a mouthful, and I am not saying that again. Um, I want them to have many common ancestors at a minimum. And for, for us, um, that can mean a generation or two or three, um, whether it be outcrossing or, you know, kind of distant line breeding, if you will. That's, that's fine. But I would like most of them to stem from a particular animal, right? So you find yourself, basically you find yourself a doe that you think is an absolute rock star, whatever that means to you. And you try to make a bunch of daughters. You find nieces, aunts, sisters, mothers, grandmothers, etc. And you, you start breeding them. And when you find the, the buck, you start making those crosses back into those generations of, of offspring. And now you're going to start eliminating certain types of, of, of gene markers. And you're going to be concentrating others. And by doing this, you're eliminating diversity of genetics and increasing the likelihood, if you selected your gene pool correctly, the likelihood that you will produce the kind of deer that you ultimately want, like, and that you believe other people will like as well. And you'll do that on scale, whatever that scale is for your place, and you'll do it consistently year over year. It sounds easy, kinda. It's not. It's really, really hard, and it takes a long, long time. And even, even um, the people that I look at that have been around a long time there's little pieces of that all over, but I don't know. I don't really know anybody that's necessarily doing that. There's some there's some variations of that, right? So, you know, if you have one particular doe that you think is really great, um, but you but you run a fifty head doe farm, you know, they're probably not all going to go back to her, but a good a good portion may. You know, you might be able to get up to 15 or 20. So you're going to have to have multiple does like that. And the, the real thing that I think would be awesome is if you did have multiple doe lines, that you made sure that those doe lines complement each other. So you have doe line A, doe line B, breed, 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 and then... Synergy, you cross them, and their traits fix each other. Now that just like think about that for a second, the the long term planning that that takes is out of control. You better have a pretty rock star freaking game plan to make that happen. Um. Anyway, that's the topic of diversity. That was my my last piece on my notes. Uh, I want to jump back to the risk management. What kind of operation do you run regarding CWD? So as I told you, you know, we, we got kind of wrapped up in that quarantine and uh, we've since been released. Obviously, there's been no CWD on our farm and we've tested as many animals as anybody, you know, per capita in Pennsylvania outside of like depopulated farms, right? Um, we have just tons and tons of tests. So um, looking at that, what is it that I'm thinking about today that was different from a couple years ago? Well, um, the Department of Agriculture in Pennsylvania, as well as the United States Department of Agriculture, um, their ability and willingness to have um, kind of interesting conversations regarding uh, chronic wasting disease and, you know, management. So that's positive for me 
the biggest thing that I've seen and one that um, I think has the most promise is the upcoming ability for uh, deer farmers across the state of Pennsylvania and across the country here in, in the United States to do genomic sampling for uh, chronic wasting disease or chronic wasting disease analysis, risk assessment. So what is this, what is this and, and, and what does it mean? Well, I, I've, done, I've done a show on it already. Um, to sum it up, there's a uh, associate professor at uh, Texas A&M, Dr. Christopher Seabury, and he has taken a really interesting approach to looking at the white-tailed deer genome, mapping it, and through various calculations and artificial and insem- artificial insemination, artificial intelligence, created a you know an assay or a, a a test that analyzes the the genome of each white-tailed deer that's tested, and then basically gives it a a score, if you will, of how likely it is for that animal to get CWD. What? Yeah, that's legit. So I can go through my herd, I could test my animals, and I can have a pretty darn high degree of certainty. Like, I think he's hitting over 80%, um, or the test is hitting over 80% that he, he created. Um in this predictive model well what does that give me the ability to do that gives me the ability to sample my herd assess risk remove risk and move forward so i'm thinking about this on a long-term basis and i'm saying to myself i am currently not uh enrolled in the herd certification program what is the what is the herd certification program allow me to do it. it allows me to take my animals and move them across state lines period that's 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 what it does that's what it's there for so you know i can't do that today but if i believe that i'm creating animals and creating a market that i think other people are going to want i should probably be ready to sell across state lines well, Josh, didn't you just say that you're trying to eliminate risk? Yeah. And then this this bomb got dropped. And the ability to to look at deer based on their their genome and say what their you know what their risk or their susceptibility level is is probably a better way to put it. Their susceptibility level is uh, based on this test and their ability to get chronic wasting disease. My goodness. So there's that. So I'm, I'm considering enrolling back in the HCP program because of that today. Because it's going to take me five years to certify. Well, if in five years, through our diligence as an industry, private investment, testing, we can start opening up some borders because the risk of our animals having or spreading chronic wasting disease is drastically lowered if not more long-term eliminated i want to be a part of that because this deer business is gonna boom like for real and you know some of us are like oh it's been booming yep it has for a very very small percentage of people but it used to boom for a lot more and i think that um, there's an opportunity for that again. Now, with that said, it's important that we know that we have things to work on as an industry from a um, public perception uh, perspective, from a legislative perspective. Um, and, you know, as an industry as a whole, I think that we need to do a better job telling people what we do and what that looks like. I'll save that for another day and how we do that. Um, so I think I think that's I think that's a good place to wrap up. I, I do 
<laughs> I am I am crunched on time, and I I hope that was a uh, uh, an enjoyable uh, rant, if you will. Um, I know we talked about organizing your farm for success, some of the physical uh, setups and such, and then uh, you know maybe a little history that you may or not have may or may not have known uh, regarding our operation here. I I enjoy. I enjoy looking at um, I enjoy looking at these things and, and and having some some deeper discussions with you all relating to my thought process around them, the industry, interesting topics, etc. Um, and I, I really hope they're they're enjoyable and beneficial to you. If they are, shoot me a quick message. I really appreciate it. It uh, it keeps keeps me going doing this this show. Um, it's it's. Again, I, I enjoy doing it. It's a it's just you know you guys gotta crack the whip on me and 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 keep me in this in this seat if you if you do enjoy it. Um, so yeah, I guess we'll we'll wrap up. Um, it's always it's always good to be you know with you all. I'm hoping to get a, an interview. Uh, I'm I'm not sure I'm gonna get it next week. I'll try. Um, we do have. I'm gonna I'm gonna plug our. Uh, Pennsylvania Deer Farmers Association uh, upcoming spring fundraiser. So that is uh, April 10th. That's in Chambersburg. You can check us out on on DV Auctions. Um, we'll have that uh, catalog linked uh, up on the you know the Pennsylvania Deer Farmers Association Facebook page, website, uh, etc. Also, same day, Nadifa. Nadifa is having their uh, virtual conference um, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So our, our auction starts um, noon on Saturday. I believe Nadifa has new deer farmers seminar in the morning, something like that, and then auctions the two previous nights. Uh, don't quote me on that. Hit up Sean Schaefer for that. Uh, you can check out the Nadifa Facebook page, some of the whitetail groups. Um, also, I, I, I always forget to do the housekeeping. I should I should have a I should have a list uh, of my my housekeeping items for the uh, the day. I'm not much of a of a list guy. I suspect most guys aren't. Um, but uh, the North American Deer Talk uh, Facebook group. So just punch in North American Deer Talk. Request to join that group. I post up all the shows there. Um, it may, you know, F- Facebook seems to be a, a common platform for people to interact with. I know a lot of folks, you know, go there on a regular basis. So if that's an easy way for you to keep track of, of the show, um, do that. Uh, if you're listening to the podcast, just you can go right to the, the page on the Service Solutions website. You can uh, click the iTunes or the RSS uh, feed button and subscribe to the podcast. So it'll download right into your iTunes or, or, or whatever Android device you're using, and then uh, the YouTube channel, something we've been we've been working on. You know, it adds a little uh, kind of third third layer of fun. You get to get to see me. Not that that's some great thing, but I feel like we're having a, a conversation here, which is um, which is cool for me. So um, you know, check that out. You know, if you like the videos, like, subscribe, leave me comments, whatever. But um, definitely hit that subscribe button. We're trying to trying to build that up a little bit. Maybe uh, I can get to the point where I can do a little bit of editing and, and, and add some good visual features, et cetera. So check that out. Um, and we'll talk to you again here real soon. With that, we'll wrap up. And as always, stay tuned for another episode of North American Deer Talk. <laughs>